Welcome to I Found This Great Book. My name is Curtis, and today we are going to explore the third book in our series of Jesse Redmond Fawcett books, The Chinaberry Tree. And so I am really, really honored today because my guests are two of the first book podcasters I began listening to. And one, they're fun. They're fun to listen to. And two, they bring some serious, deep knowledge to it while they're having their jokes. And enough of the mystery, folks. I have with me Danny and Molly from Black Chick Lit. Danny, Molly, how are you today? Hi. I'm doing I good. Wish, this is Danny, just typing yeah. myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm Molly. I wish I had, like, what is that thing they blow at the, the soccer matches? Like the, oh, the Vuzuzela. The <laughs> doo, yeah. doo, 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 doo. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing this time with me and having this discussion with me. Again, I've been a, a longtime fan of your podcast. And uh, Danny and Molly have so much fun. You need to check them out on Black Chick Lit. Okay, that's B L A C K C H I C K L I T dot com. You go to the website, they have all their links. You also mm-hmm. want to check them out on Twitter, Black Chick Lit, because they, they drop some uh, good ones on Twitter every now and then. So you want to you wanna check them out, listen to their podcast. Um, Recently, they did a, a a real fun podcast where they talked about <laughs> with the with the Love gentleman from Ratchet uh <laughs> Ratchet Book Club. And you, yeah, you guys uh, mm-hmm. lit into one book, and and I don't even read Street Lit, but I I listened to the whole thing, and I thought, <laughs> man, that was, that sounds fun. I just got to find some time to read it, but uh, <laughs> just just to hate on it like y'all were, but <laughs> but uh, that aside. You definitely want to check out their podcast. These are two brilliant, brilliant women who bring fun and also good insight into literature of all sorts. And um, enough of me fanboying. I'm going to, we're going to get into this book by Jesse Redman Fawcett. Now, The China Berry Tree is the third book that Jesse Redman Fawcett had published. And it was published in 1931. So it is 90 years old. Mm -hmm. A true classic. And uh, what's great is that we're able to have this conversation. We're able to get three book nerds uh, from across the country together and talk about a classic and hopefully inspire you to read uh, the works of Jesse Redmond Fawcett and, uh, and her. She was a pivotal person during the Harlem Renaissance. She was the editor of The Crisis magazine which is a magazine for the NAACP she as editor she was one of the first publishers of a lot of the people we know as the icons of the Harlem Renaissance uh the crisis magazine was the first magazine to publish a poem by Langston Hughes so that's cool she definitely had an impact and she edited all of the greats of the Harlem Renaissance and so we want to pay homage to her and her works. And the Chinaberry Tree, it covers the lives of three women, I would say. Uh, Lavernatine, Melissa, and Aunt Sal. And uh, so Aunt Sal is the mother of Lavernatine, and Melissa is Aunt Sal's sister's daughter. And it talks about their lives as they come together and dealing with dealing with small town gossip and uh, people's beliefs about people and um, biases and class and well, hey, the first line when you look at the back of the book, adultery, incest, and questions of racial identity simmer beneath the tranquil suburb surface of suburban life in this novel set in a small New Jersey town in the early 1900s. 
Okay, that tells you right there. You're like, what mm-hmm. in the world could be happening in the 1900s with all that mess? So, <laughs> lays it all out for you right there, and 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 it doesn't disappoint. It it brings that right to the table. So let's get started talking about the book and what I like to know. Um, so, Molly, Danny, when you were reading this book, how did it make you feel? as you were reading it, and then how did it make you feel when you finished? You want to go, Molly? Yeah, I can start. Um, it, it definitely, I think when we, when Curtis first asked us to be on the show, and then we got the copies of the book, you know, just being real, we looked at it and we were like, oh no, oh no, this is going to be above our ability. Um <laughs> You know, because it looked so academic, it was an older book, and we've both been going through, like, so many life changes. It's like, okay, I I think I told Danielle, I was like, okay, two months early, I'm going to read this book to make sure I have enough time so I can focus, I can give the attention. And I literally turned it over, I read that first one, and I was like, oh, I see why he asked us to do this book now. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like you said, it it does not disappoint. Like, it's, it's of the time, like, I feel like it has that mm-hmm. kind of older, slower slice of life feel that you get from this time period. Um, but at the same time, it felt very modern with like the things that they were discussing and um, mm-hmm. uh, particularly the two cousins uh, of the trio. They just felt very like girls you couldn't know. So um, mm-hmm. it, it's it's. I think I read it a lot faster than I thought I would because I was just like, oh, what about this? What about this? What about that? And at the end, I was like, okay, I really feel like I had a good sense of these people and this place. And it it, it was kind of cool. Like you keep saying, oh, it's 90 years ago, but it felt like a piece of like our history that we don't always get to see reflected in literature because we did not read Fawcett in school. Like, no, you know, did I. yeah, and we both, took lit classes we took black women's lit classes and you know besides maybe a little mention or something like I I don't think anyone had ever you know sat down to to say um you know talk about her work or um just the freshness that I felt from this novel if that makes sense Mm -hmm. yeah I was going to tie in how I read reading it it was her pacing, it was a little slow to start, but when she gets going, it really goes and it really pulls you in. You really know what's going on with these characters. It kind of, and I don't mean this as a compliment nor as an insult, it's just an observation. It kind of reminded me as a, of a Tyler Perry movie. Just some of the archetypes, some of the challenges the characters face. And so that it did feel kind of timeless. It did feel like this is this is something that's gonna could be happening in a small town, you know, around it takes place it takes place in the north i keep forgetting that it doesn't take place in the south but it does feel like it could take place you know in 2021 i started by reading the foreword which i believe was it written by um fawcett herself yes she mentioned specifically she wanted to talk about that group of people who hadn't been talked about a lot in contemporary writings like educated you know colored folk and that really piqued sort of my interest because she was right in a lot of the older writings i've read you don't get a lot of like the upper middle class black folk. You don't get their perspective. You don't get their stories. So going into it, I was really interested in that aspect of it. Okay. And, and as a full disclosure, I did not know what the, that this, this book had the drama it is had. I did not say, <laughs> Oh, let me talk about this trash with <laughs> Danny and Molly. Yeah. It would have been totally, it truly, okay. <laughs> it truly was by accident. But then, you know, you guys have, uh, covered some of the street lit uh, <laughs> items and tore into those. And I said, you know, okay, we're all right. It just so happened. Yeah. <laughs> but, we're uh, really excited. We're like, our brand is is getting out there. Strong. <laughs> you know, someone <laughs> took a picture in front of a wall on Twitter and it was like black heroes. And she was like, she put it up on Twitter. And she was like, if you need to know what our brand is, she put it up on Twitter. She tagged us. She was like, thought you would like who's over my right shoulder. And it was Beethoven. Yeah. 
So the ratchet brand, it's strong with us. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I had the same feeling. Again, the, the story starts off and you, you get that sense of small town gossip and small town mm-hmm. perceptions of people. Even though it's Jersey, it's Southern Jersey. It's not it, yeah. Newark. It's not, a, um, you know. Or it's, small town Jersey. it's small town Jersey and the the way people perceive. Uh, so uh, there are going to be some spoilers. We're going to do a little bit of talking about the book. Spoiler, spoil, spoiler lists. <laughs> and then we're going to dip in. So we're, we're just going to talk some general stuff and then we're going to I'll let you know. <laughs> and uh, at that point, you need to read the book or else we're just going to we're going to spoil some things. But when I was reading this book. I did feel this dark cloud that hung over the the Mm -hmm. poor uh, women in this story and how unfair it was and how um, stupid it was. Mm -hmm. But then it was a story, considering when it was the early 1900s and the fact that, you know, racism was in full swing, it was, you know, uh, the raw hardcore yeah you can't come here racism there was nothing subtle there were no microaggressions matter of fact microaggressions hadn't even been invented during this time period it was just full on aggression and even in the northern states um there were these there was still open discrimination against black people but and slavery wasn't that long ago there were generations who knew it uh Mm -hmm. walking around interacting with people and yet their lives weren't dictated by that. You know, it, there was a black middle class and, um, well, there are all sorts of class structures among black people, as Fawcett tells you early on. Mm-hmm. And you really see the humanness of black people. And what's amazing is in that time period, consider everything that was going on, they made this world. Uh, and also you see how people are people and due to stupid beliefs, they punish people for nothing at all. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's a great story, but it's also disappointing because you realize, come on now, folks, y'all just came out of slavery. Why are you taking on the behaviors <laughs> of the people mm-hmm. who just ran one of the worst institutions in the world? But I digress. Um, so if you were going to describe this story to someone, someone came up to you and said, oh, yeah, well, yeah, how would you describe it? Would you, what kind of genre would you call it? Or how would you describe it? And, and also, who would you recommend this story to? That's a good question. Well, I, I'll follow up with my... so. Not to, sorry, Molly, not to step on your toes. I just no, don't want to speak on people, but I'll follow up on my Tyler Perry thing that it does feel sort of like a family, like a domestic, not a thriller. It does have a tinge of suspense, but like a family, you know, domestic fiction. It feels sort of, genre is hard. I will say that it does remind me, like I said, of the old Tyler Perry plays where you have, mm-hmm. you know, a tragic woman or women and the men in their life who either you know are either there to help them or to hurt them and then the Mm -hmm. church plays church and god plays somewhat of a role it's there um but it's really just these people and there's like a moral and there's a lesson to be learned so we have you know the fallen women well no let me not spoil it but you know we have you know certain actions brought on by women due to um behavior that is looked frowned upon by on society and then we have them you know looking for men in the safety and security that they hope to find in marriage so it sort of gives me the like again a Tyler Perry maybe those vibes I would mm-hmm. it also had you know some street lit vibes mm-hmm. like the messiness mm-hmm. so I would actually say if you enjoy any of those two things and you don't mind some of the old timiness of the writing I would say you should definitely give it a give it a go Mhm. Mhm. Yeah, I would say if you like sitting on a porch <laughs> and gossiping, because that—that's I love Danny. Like your your Tyler Perry, um, like connection because it it 
does really feel like a story your grandma or your great aunt would kind of tell you about the neighbor. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like that old timey mess. Um, And it is, you know, it's, it's very nicely written. It, it does feel of its time, but at the same time, it, it has that core that is just, it's just mess. (laughs) And I think that a lot of people will relate and pick up on that. So yeah, I I think that, you know, uh, maybe there's some hesitancy. We always see people arguing back and forth about they don't read, you know, literature. They don't read literature or classics because it's all about a 45 year old white man who hates his children or something like that. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, okay, that's not true. And here's a great example of, Mm -hmm. you know, if we can expand to all kinds of genre, like we can expand our our palettes to classics too. So Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people would enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. And tying off what Molly said, I love that it's not just about women, but it's about like young women, really young Mm -hmm. women, one who's still in school, which I don't think is something. And like the classics you get to see a lot of, of like, you know, what was it like to be a teenager in the early 1900s? Oh, well, it turns out it's a lot like being a teenager (laughs) in 2020. So same angst, same um, Mm -hmm. worrying about friends and having friends and then. Same thing and happens. You're in the group, and then all of a mm. sudden, you're not in the group. And you're like, mm-hmm. what happened? Uh, yesterday, I was sitting at the table, and today, I, I can't sit at the table. And mm-hmm. What did I do? It's like, And, of course, nobody can tell you because you're not in the group. So, mm-hmm. so you're just sitting there by yourself. At the, at the you don't have a group yet table. Mm-hmm. Uh, and before we shift to the spoiler version folks we're going to give you one more uh, treat here how do you think the story holds up you know it's a 90 year old story yeah I, I think it holds up really well i think it's still really um relatable i think it's very um approachable is not the word i'm thinking of but it's easy to get into accessible, um maybe. accessible yeah i think sometimes there's a fear with classic lit that if I don't have the background, I don't have the, you know, the education, I didn't go get an English degree or something, like I'm not gonna get it. I think that, um, you know, there's a thread in this that is just very human and very familiar as a story that like Dan- Danny said, it's it's kind of timeless in that way. Yeah, yeah, it's about family and the really, you know, cr- family and people and the crazy relationships between family and people. And I feel like we can all in some way, you know, find some way to enter that and get into the story. I also was surprised by how sort of forward thinking and progressive the characters were in their own way. They're, they're not, you know, they were written in the 1930s, but a lot of the attitudes surrounding some of the issues that come up in the book, you know, you had kids, or the kids, you had like some of the younger people saying like, you know, it's not always going to be this way. Things are going to change. I'm looking forward to it in terms of race, in terms of, you know, the drama that's going on amongst the the family members and the mm-hmm. situation that people find themselves in. So I think it held up rather well. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I And I, I keep in mind, you know, because, you know, somehow or another Shakespeare who wrote plays for the commoners is something highbrow stuff. That, you know, people, hoo, 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 and they go to and they don't understand, they fall asleep on. But, uh, but you know, they're there and it's not for you. And, you know, Jesse um, Redmond Fawcett was writing for everyday people. She was not just writing for, you know, 12 academics who mm-hmm. argue about, um, like you said, whether the man in the story hated his kids or not. Uh, it. <laughs> She was writing the stories and she was telling the stories of her people that she knew. And so, and also you you brought up a good point when you said about how the classics and we're, we hear that and a lot of people shut off, but I think of classics as I have a very broad generalization that I say, (laughs) Mm -hmm. if you can find something written by someone who's no longer alive and they're capturing a time that you didn't know. You know, that's a classic. Uh, and the fact that we can read these, uh, I think we just need to broaden that 
perspective and 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 that you know you read to enjoy the story not to you know it's not it's not calculus it's it's mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. a story it it should entertain and if it doesn't entertain then you, you kind of miss the mark if it doesn't mm-hmm. make you want to turn the page you know if you have to fight every page you might not be reading a good story it may not be deep <laughs> it just might not be a good story right yeah. i feel like i feel like that's our approach but it runs so contrary to how like if you think back to your english lit class in high school mm-hmm. where there's and maybe i just had terrible teachers <laughs> I, I mean i did have terrible teachers <laughs> but they were terrible for other reasons uh one of them when we read huck Finn, he was like uh, uh turn around and look at the black people in class oh, you're gosh. joking me no i'm not you're, well, see, I, I don't know. I went to all black schools, so that means you, 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 wherever you turn, you're going to see black people. But see, I went serious? to all black school up until high school. That shit was a culture shock. He was like, "Why do you think there are only two black kids in class with us today?" Oh, Racism. God. She also allegedly, um, after I left, we had we had problems. Me and him. Um, <laughs> culminating in him like yelling at me saying do you think i'm a racist but um allegedly he got fired after he stole all the ap uh lit money Mm. from the class and just didn't turn it in Mm. so all that aside i feel like there's this english teacher that lives certainly in my mind maybe in others who's like well if it's not difficult if you're not able to write a paper on it if you're enjoying it then it's not worthy of the title of literature it's not worthy of your time and it's just very refreshing to hear someone say like okay or maybe it's just bad yeah <laughs> yeah you know it, it's not the story for you it, it's it's okay mm-hmm. um everybody has a story they want to read and and reading requires so much more energy than watching a television show mm-hmm. um that it should be a story you want to read and uh What's, and what's sad is how many people have been put off reading mm-hmm, because exactly. they were forced to. So I'm going to tell my personal trauma. Uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> when I was in, uh, I guess it was elementary school, we had to read Laura Ingalls Wilder. Wilder. No, we read little, her too. And we had to read that. And my poor mom um, had to listen to me rant every night. Why do I have to <laughs> read this? We gotta, then we got to find a simile or a metaphor. Yada, yada. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, she said, "Well, Curtis, just read another." And I and 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 not knowing, I was like, "How can I relate to this? Some white girl on the in a prairie, and I don't live in a prairie. Why do I have to read this?" Um, but fortunately, my mom was a media specialist in the library, and my dad had a lot of books, so I was always around books. But yeah, I was like, "Why am I reading this? This I don't care about this story." You know, so y'all are both better students than me because we had to read <laughs> Harry Potter in seventh grade, and I had already tried it by that point, so I just didn't read it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, like, no, I'm sorry. A lot of books I just didn't read. <laughs> what did you? So what did you end up doing in that situation? Well, you know, you I, just have to. You know, you, <laughs> your parents are like, uh, "You're gonna read that or die." <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I was brought up in the day of uh, capital punishment, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> what would with English class, my parents knew old, I was a good enough student that they didn't really watch that closely. So I just decided not to read Harry Potter. And I just sort of coasted because I was like, I had heard enough by osmosis yeah. to get through it. I was like, yeah, I'm not reading that. Because I liked what kind of what Molly said about. So this is kind of a shift, but it ties into Harry Potter. I like what Molly said about like, if we feel like if we don't have to work for it, or if it's not literature, or if it's not, you know, something highfalutin, it's not worthy or it doesn't count because i feel like i run into that with the um hesitant readers in my own life like when they picture or when they think of sitting down to read a book it's always like you know like something slow and maybe boring and heavy and i try to say like it doesn't have to be like that if you like reading murder mysteries read murder mysteries if you like Mm -hmm. reading you know love stories or you like leaving like wizard books read those books it's all reading don't let book snobbery that has, as Molly said, been ingrained in us, I think, from, you know, education. Don't let book snobbery keep you from enjoying things that you might find you actually enjoy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's like a lifelong love that you can have with books. And you can, it's just like you said, it 
And this is going to sound so reading rainbow. <laughs> I don't think LeVar Burton listens to us. Maybe he listens to Curtis because Curtis is class. You know what I mean? Classy. <laughs> class. But I have a feeling we might be muted. From the- <laughs> but I'll just say, like, this is going to sound like very reading rainbow, but it really can transport you to a time or a place in a way for me that I don't get from other media mm-hmm. like I really felt like I was in this town mm-hmm. like yes. when they're on the snow and they're like going to such and so's house and they're walking down the lane like mm-hmm. and it's like little things because um so if this is written in 31 and it's about a town in the early 1900s like that's outside of you know older family members things I heard growing up that's not something I I know but you you feel like the little things, how they get the lantern, how mm-hmm. what a China berry tree is with the, you know, gate around it, how everyone's looking out windows to snoop on each other. And it just, it transports you to a time and place just so effortlessly. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, I don't know, you, so many people, I think, just have a hesitancy, like you said, Danielle, because of that English teacher in their head. It, it's such a shame because it, it almost feels like you lose some of these connections to the past sometimes. Yeah, I loved jumping off that. I loved the way all the little descriptors in this book were written. Like every time they described someone's outfit or mm-hmm. like a meal they were sitting down to eat or like, you know, the room setting, it just really painted a picture of like what life was like back then mm-hmm. that, you know, details you wouldn't pick up on like in a movie or you know a tv show so yeah i think it's really great and it does take you back through history in a way yeah yeah it almost feels more real than if i were to see it like in a movie like you said and i don't know if that's just my own perception like i don't know learning types like i've always been a reader i've always had like that strong imagination so it just it it washes over you in a way that i don't think a movie could or um you know an album or something at least for me personally well i think it might have to do with the durability of books like film from the 30s like you know like we've mm-hmm. lost especially black but you know mm-hmm. they've lost hundreds of films that were made by like black directors with black authors or actors from that time whereas with books i'm sure some has been lost but it's easier to keep you know, a transcript of a book together, reprint, republish, make it mm-hmm. widely available so you can actually read it directly from, true, from the people of that time. Th- this is like a copy, like a photocopy of an I know. older book, it looks yeah. like. Yeah. 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 yeah this, when they do the classic press, they, they you know, they, it's not like they sat down and typed it over. They just <laughs> said, ooh, let me get the book and I'll scan it. <laughs> and um, so... I don't know if that's a matter of a copyright thing or like if long I'm reproducing the original is okay or it was just real cheap to do it. But yeah, it, it does look like a scanned copy of the, the original. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and, and the best stories are in books. You know, there are stories that can be written for books that it just are not economically feasible to do as a, a movie or a television show because it's just so expensive to do those. So, Mm -hmm. you have to Mm -hmm. get a broader audience so you have to broaden your story and you can't niche down whereas in a book if you want a mystery where the sleuth is a vampire you know i actually (laughs) could recommend one so you (laughs) can pull some up but you you can uh yeah you, you just um you can do that an author can do that and create a work and and like you said, the durability of it that, you know, I in the went to the Library of Congress and they have at the Library of Congress one of the Gutenberg Bibles that were printed on wow. the Gutenberg Press. And you're like, oh, and it's still around. Uh, That's right. Whereas a digital, even our digital media, you know, we're just one electromagnetic pulse away from, a, whoop, <laughs> we have nothing, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> but books will be around. Mm-hmm. Folks, now see all of this good discussion is what you get when you listen to Black Book Lit. <laughs> and right about now, giving everybody you, you need to go and not now because you need to keep listening to us. 
but you definitely want to check out their podcast. But I'm also letting you know, we're going to dip into the spoiler area here. So we're going to start saying some stuff that's kind of revealing about the story, but we need to talk about some of these people and their mm-hmm. trashy ways. And uh, <laughs> we just got to, we just got to mm-hmm. spoil some things. So if you don't want to be spoiled and you just want to read the book, just go to I found this great book.com slash Jesse, and you'll see all Jesse Fawcett's books there. You can click and you could go make your purchase. You can catch up with us and then you can listen to the rest of the show when mm-hmm. we're going to talk about these messy people. Mm-hmm. All right. So, three, two, one. Okay. Spoilers are full in effect. We need to talk about these people. So, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk first about Aunt Sal, who mm-hmm. grew up in a time, I think, just slightly after slavery, maybe. And mm-hmm. uh, she fell in love with the the son of the owner of the land, Mm -hmm. came back home, saw her, was mesmerized, and wanted her. And they had a love. Mm -hmm. They had a Mm -hmm. true love. A love that after he passed, she never recovered from. But, Mm -hmm. um, and he loved her. He took care of her. He made sure she was taken, acknowledged her. Even though he married somebody else and had kids by somebody else Mm -hmm. because he had to. He couldn't just say, I'm going to be with my black wife. Uh, (laughs) He did let her know that her child was his child and he made sure she was taken care of. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about Aunt Sal? Aunt Sal was such a classic street lit mom. Yes, that's where I got those vibes and we started it on. Yeah. Like so classic like you know uh this beautiful woman whose kind of time has passed man has passed um you know uh, has withdrawn from the life of her children she isn't violent like a lot of those moms could be mm-hmm. but she definitely gives me the sense of some of the moms of um uh who's the mom in the cartel um i can't remember her name but she's like always in like a long flowing like uh i don't know like uh robe or something and she's wearing like the stilettos on her marble and she's just looking out the window you know letting herself fade away like a ghost because her husband is dead Mm -hmm. (laughs) she was kind of like a tragic character the book at certain points gets kind of meta and compares itself to a greek tragedy Mm -hmm. and she does sort of fill that role where she had this love but even in being accepted by him, it sort of ruined her life. Had it not mm-hmm. been a secret, had he not been so open, she might not have been, you know, kind of ostracized from the rest of the, I'm going to say colored community, like I'm from the 1800s, <laughs> but she wouldn't have been ostracized from the rest of the, like the black community. But it does feel like she and Laurentine live in this, like, like under this heavy, like veil, like where they're separated from everyone. Everything seems to be really sad and dour they don't feel welcome she doesn't feel like laurentine doesn't feel welcome to talk to the other children sal feels cut off from everyone so she is a tragic character and i kind of wish we had seen a bit more of her Mm -hmm. because it is her life that sets up the circumstances for the whole book but she is a good character and she is she's very um she's an urban lit mom she is less Mm -hmm. violent but she Mm -hmm. suffers as an urban lit mom Mm -hmm. is supposed Mm -hmm. to suffer yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I I felt for her because unfortunately she truly did have a love with the gentleman, uh, with mm-hmm. Colonel Holloway. Truly did have a love with him, and their love was deep. But society said you can't be together. Mm-hmm. But because of who he was and the power he had, he could do what he wanted to do, mm-hmm. because nobody really wanted to tick him off because a whole lot of jobs would do to him. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a constant uh, it's um, theme uh, the the poor women in this story are always tied to the men and what they have. And uh, mm-hmm. it's so different from, well, hopefully it's different from now, <laughs> where, yeah. you know, women can kind of make their own. It's not a matter of, well, mm, like, uh, 
Florentine and, and Melissa were kind of deciding which kind of man they wanted based on the life they wanted as opposed yeah. to I want mm-hmm. the life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I do like that Sal never seemed ashamed. Like even if she did seem sad by like the circumstances that sort of came up, she never seemed ashamed of her life and the choices she made. So I thought that was like, she was a strong character. Yeah. Yeah. And another depiction of uh, black womanhood. It was, people are people. And, uh, you know, that, that <laughs> sometimes we forget race uh, can, and bigotry can make us really think that, you know, one, grown, one group of people are kangaroos and another group of people are zebras and they're not, they're, they're humans. And, uh, we're, um, people fall in love and mm-hmm. in spite of racial bigotry and, and, and that's, that's sometimes in stories where people bring their own biases to it. Well, I, that shouldn't happen. Or why do they bring this? Okay. But they're two human beings who fell in love and, uh, get over it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, the key is they felt in love so much that they were willing to deal with all of the bias and all of the pressure that would come down on them, which most people would run away from. Mm-hmm. And yet they loved each other through that and a mad love to the point where when he died, she was, you know, part of her died. And uh, that's, that's amazing to hear. I don't know if it's good, but, you know. <laughs> you know uh, but then he also saw that she was taken care of, which yes, was also, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even though the ex, the wife, wife did yes. say, well, I'm, I'm still shamed. And even though, you know, why don't you just move on? You got money. Move on. Right. <laughs> you still, you still here. Like, Mm-mm, she's still here. And I haven't driven her off. And she's like, I'm not going anywhere. You know? Right. He was my love too. So, yeah. Okay. So Laurentine, her daughter. I was very concerned about Laurentine. I'm glad she got. I'm glad she got her happy ending because she was such a tragic character. She was. I could picture this little awkward girl, who you know the other children wouldn't play with her, except for that one summer when her aunt was around and helped her sort of find her, you know, find her place. But no one would play with her. She felt like she lived under this, the, the you know the shadow of her parents' quote unquote sin. And so she she wanted security. She wanted family. She wanted marriage. She wanted a legitimate name. She wanted all of those things. And she went through a lot to get it. So so I was happy by her her outcome. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, to me, it kind of seemed like someone took like a. A character who was like on the tragic mulatto train mm-hmm. and just shook her and said, Snap out of it. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta live this way. Yeah, I was proud of her by the end. She like realized yeah. how she close she was to marrying, was it Hatchet? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just because he accepted her. And she's like, no, I can do better. And she does. She gets a doctor. Mm-hmm. Good for you. Yeah. The life she wanted. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. She, I was proud of her. Definitely interesting. And it's it's like she had she has you know, when we start off, she has so such little agency kind of in in her personal life. Mm-hmm. But she's like a beast with her dressmaking business. Mm-hmm. Like she's bossing these other two girls around, bossing her, <laughs> you know, uh, half sisters, bossing her cousin. Like she's she's running the show, and um, you know, she is making a life and making money and providing, you know, to some extent for herself. And that I feel like is kind of rare i think in um books from this time mm-hmm. sometimes because i think that there was this and i could be talking out of my ass but i feel like there was this um kind of clash this push and pull with respectability and it's kind of like okay well what you know you know where a generation two generations removed from slavery at this point we're past reconstruction we are entering you know this new century um you kind of wanted like there and i'm not explaining this to anybody um people who hear this podcast will know this history but there's a contingency of people who were like okay well we should be like the white people and emulate them and you know our women have that fragility that white women they should um emulate that um 
And then there was the other side where it's like, well, no, that's not really how we're living. Like women have their own agency. Black women are at the forefront of these cultural movements. We are making our own way. We are like, we can be breadwinners, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel like sometimes in books in the Harlem Renaissance, not always, but sometimes the women kind of take a back seat mm-hmm. because that's just what it was respect- respectable, quote unquote, some people thought. So it was very interesting to see the women in this have, you know, varying degrees of agency over their businesses, over their personal lives and struggling with, like Laurentine does, do I step back and just become like, you know, this decoration for this man, basically, and his political ambitions? Or can I do something with my own life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll dovetail and just say, I think what was interesting with Laurentine was that for her, it wasn't about like a tangible thing. She had her own money. Mm -hmm. She had skills. She could take care of herself. It was about, you know, that it was about getting that respectability, Mm -hmm. about being above reproach. Both she and Melissa are very obsessed for different reasons with being respectable, being above reproach. Laurentine, because she knows she has to sort of compensate for her family history. Melissa, because she thinks she does she thinks she's in a better she's better mm-hmm. off than her cousin and her aunt and she doesn't want them to taint her mm-hmm. her aura of you know respectability so i just thought that was a really interesting way to look at it because i've read a lot of books that deal with like you know women needing to marry but usually it's for more tangible things mm-hmm. money a home this one i thought was interesting just for like the social aspect of what you know marriage at this time meant for women in terms of like just being respected as people in a society Mm -hmm. so let's talk about melissa oh this child (laughs) (laughs) the third child third point of the triangle she was the heroine of our street fic (laughs) yeah she has more time dedicated to her than anybody Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah she's she's the She's the titular character. She's interesting. I really, I will say I kind of suspected the book does a really good job, I think, at keeping the big mystery, but you do Mm -hmm. get enough hints to sort of put things together. So reading as Melissa does all these things and brags about her dad, John, or not brags, but, you know, talks about her father, John Paul, and how he died before she could ever know him and just sort of. She she says poor Laurentine, but when you're reading the book, you're like, oh, poor Melissa. She, yeah, just, you, she does not. She has no idea. Your mom just sent you off somewhere and said, oh, no, I can't take you because I got a new man. That right. too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. I got a new man. Right. So go show up at your cousin's house. <laughs> and she's like, I wonder why she didn't take me because your mom is your mom is is a free spirit. She's. Judy, the mom, she was like, "Mm, no, nah, I'm, I, I ain't phased, nah." It, it, so. Going back to your street lit, Judy would be that one friend who'd be like, mm, "Whatever, I don't care." <laughs> mm-hmm. She, Judy, she's the one like, if you don't like it, you missing out. Bye, and moving on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. she's the one who stirs up the plot. There would be no yeah. book if not for your Judy. Yeah, that's true. She's the one yeah. who, who brought in that. And added a, and they thought poor uh, Aunt Sal and uh, Colonel Holloway was the big dude. <laughs> that ain't nothing, you know. Right. So, uh, did you guess early on what this big secret might be in terms of uh, Melissa and her? And Mallory. And Mallory. Yes, I did just because they were. It was not that she was seeing all these different boys. It was that specific boy that yeah. everyone that the neighbor, the neighbors had a problem with. Yeah. 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 And we knew from like the blurb on the back that something was <laughs> yeah. up. Something was up. Yeah. It was no creepy uncle messing with him. So yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So I will say she does a good job, even though Melissa is kind of a I don't want to say it's kind of kind of she's kind of a silly character. She she wants to aspire for these like she wants she wants to go places. She wants to do things. So I guess not silly, but she is a very young character. Mm -hmm. But in that she's sympathetic like she is. She's like 18. She Mm -hmm. wants to get out of Redbrook. 
She wants. She doesn't want to be like her mother. She doesn't want to be like her sad aunt and cousin. <laughs> mm-hmm. She wants. You know, she wants better for herself, and like that's mm-hmm. great. It's just she's sort of the choices she makes sometimes in going about that. You're just like, oh, sweetie. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she's she reads very much like a teenager. Yes. It was very accurate. I'm very it's determined. Humorous. I know what I'm doing, but I'm making bad decisions. Oh. Yep. Yep. And not always aware of when she is not being tr- like, well, she has some instincts, like with what's his face, the um violent bow she has sort of um, at the beginning. Harry Rollins. Yes. <laughs> But I'm going to be up front and say I do not like Mallory, and I think he did not treat her well. <laughs> and she doesn't really pick up on it. She doesn't see that he sees her more as like um, not a trophy, but a like maybe almost a pet, like something he can mm-hmm. care for, and you know make pretty. She's a little she, she's a little more educated than she is, and he likes that too. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, he is rather patronizing and. Mm-hmm. Oh, my little pet. Oh, you little, you know, like. Honey, he calls her. Yeah. Yeah. And not in yeah. an endearing way. It's uh, <laughs> the way you talk to a child. Like, oh, honey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you think yeah. you, oh, that's good. You know, your ABCs. Good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it, so it, wonderful. It did read as kind of like the men you meet in your life. <laughs> you know, the different type of men you might date in your life. Yes. You got you know, the condescending uh, proto asshole. Yeah. You got the little um, uh, baby hotep. Um. <laughs> okay. I want to see who, which one do you, because which one do you think is a baby hotep? It was the one who she ends up with, who Melissa Asher? ends up with. Asher? Yes. Yeah. Oh, you didn't I, like I, Asher? <laughs> no, I liked Asher. I thought he was a great character, but some of the stuff he was saying, I was like, yeah. oh. <laughs> I made a little note when I was yeah, reading, and I wrote down Asher, and I put woke with question marks. <laughs> yes. Hmm. yes, woke. woke. And I was like, wow, that's almost 100 years ago. And Yes. Wow. Like he, he is a dude on Twitter. Maybe not LLC Twitter, <laughs> but like, or if you follow him on Instagram, he might have one or two people, and it's like, why you follow them? And he's like, well, they give a good advice sometimes. We should go back to the land, own things as black people. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, Okay, that's... Yeah, I could see that. If he told her to be a good girl one more time, though, I was oh, as yeah. annoyed of it as she was. Because I'm like, what are you trying to say? <laughs> what, what do you think I'm doing? What do you think I'm doing? They kept saying, be a good girl. Like, okay, she ain't out here wilding. She ain't. She didn't invent twerking. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, she ain't doing videos. I mean, wow. What is yeah. that? Page- uh, so, as a guy. Uh, mm-hmm. I have I have known Harry Robbins in my world. I've known some of them in my life. I've seen some of them. I remember in college, there was one dude. He he was having an emotional moment because a young lady <laughs> danced with somebody else, and and then he was acting creepy outside. And she asked me, "Can you walk me into my car?" I said, "Yeah, sure." Mm-hmm. Walk into her car and uh, come back, and he says, "Well, Curtis, look, if you ain't gonna get in the woman's panties, man, don't be blocking me." Oh, okay, yeah. you a rapist. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, she just asked me to walk through the car. And I'm thinking, okay, something, and you're just 20? Something is wrong, man. You, you, mm-hmm. I don't know. There's yeah. s- somewhere in your brain, there's a synapse that just is. Ain't fire. Or, or it's firing way wrong. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but. She did, a, she did a, good job of capturing like that entitled um attitude though yeah. of that mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. man mm-hmm. so because it was like it made me uncomfortable i was like i hope this guy doesn't stick around because I, I yeah i don't want to read about him and he's and he was around to the end constantly just having his emotions you see that with people i they don't have they're not aware of their own emotions or maybe they're mentally disturbed or something i don't know but they just uh are raging yeah. because you aren't mine and I decided I want you. And exactly. at mm-hmm. no point is it like, maybe I should back up a little here. Mm-hmm. Even mm-hmm. when he got his butt beat. Okay, <laughs> usually that calms people down when they get their face <laughs> smashed. <laughs> when Asher was like, okay, now that I got you down, but that's not enough. Let me, get, let me punch on you some more. Right. After that, you still talking mess. <laughs> oh, you know, I want to talk mess. 
Dude. And, and then you have what's his name? Um Laurentine's first boo. Ugh. Looking looking around the corner during that fight, like, oh, I can't be part of that mess. Oh yeah. Like this goes back to Danny's um uh um Tyler Perry analogy. It's like they're all at the cookout, <laughs> mm-hmm. they have a fight, the next scene is somebody in a lace front braids, like I can't um be a part of your ratchet family. Yeah. <laughs> be around your hood family because i want to be a politician and i need the right people right. around me it it sounds it sounds like it could be from a tyler perry play or movie <laughs> that, yes like that line so maybe tyler perry was reading some of these books from the night and he just kind of you know i could adapt this See, people think he doesn't read but maybe he's like you know what nobody knows about this story let me <laughs> <laughs> or these are just stories, you know, because, you know, the melodrama is is, mm-hmm. is a constant. That's in all lit. You know, you have melodrama. Mm-hmm. And we never have, you get three people together, somebody's talking about somebody. You know, exactly. it's, it's, you have that. And, um, but what's great is you get this view of black people during that time period. And it's not just, oh, I'm struggling and. Mm-hmm. Oh. Right, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or some deep philosophical thing. It's okay. This is a fun story. It was some mess in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like fight for some at the ice carnival. Yeah, yeah, because when he, when the guy was knocked out and his feet were on the ice and his head in the that snow, was I was like, <laughs> like it was, it was legitimately hilarious. Yeah, yeah. I legitimately would have liked to be there to see that. Yeah, like oh. I thought this would have made a good movie. Yep. like the drama. I think of it, it could still. Yeah. 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 The reason, so I brought up Tyler Perry because the thing about Tyler Perry is he's just as insulting to black men as he is to black women. <laughs> it's, it's great. And like his thing is in his movies, it's always the the humble, you know, blue collar man of the earth who mm-hmm. is the, the good man. Mm-hmm. Whereas if he's a professional or if he's too worldly or if he's too educated or dark skinned, like let's bring up the colors of two, <laughs> he is. He is the bad man. And so I kind of saw shades of that in this. You had Mallory, who, like um, Melissa, aspires to, you know, do big things. He was going to go and was he the one who was going to be an engineer? Yeah. Yeah. He was going to go off, be a professional, be an engineer. And then you had Osher, who who was, you know, stable and, and really loved Melissa, but he was just going to be a farmer. Mm-hmm. Granted, a college-educated farmer who, I guess, was going to be in charge of, like, a really big operation but mm-hmm. and then the book sort of shows us like he's the better choice so that's where i really got the tyler perry vibes because mm-hmm. tyler Perry does not like educated professional men because <laughs> yeah, they are always not. the bad guys yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but people gobble it up people love it mm-hmm. <laughs> they do love those stories mm-hmm. so um who is your favorite character mm. That's okay. That's a question. Let me think on that. Um, I think Melissa was my favorite character. I'm leaning that way too. She was the most interesting to read about, and her story was the most compelling. Yeah, it's kind of fun to have a character where you know more than the character does. Mm -hmm. Because when she's out here being all wild, you know, being a hater, you're kind of like, oh, Melissa. (laughs) They don't get you, boo. Mm -hmm. Laurentine is a close second like I was really Mm -hmm. proud of her by the end of the book of how she had grown and you know found her way and found you know comfort with herself she was a little nasty there during the (laughs) it's like Laurentine take a step back you're you're the adult here first of all why are you reading somebody's diary why are you getting you you look at all of what you have look at all of what you have People desire your dresses, and you're so mm-hmm. good that you didn't want to make a dress for a black person because you were afraid of what the white people were going to say. <laughs> I was who, so mad. I was like, what? <laughs> right. First of all, who would know? Second, really? That was one of, there aren't a lot of moments where the se- segregation, I guess, between like black people and white people comes up in this book. Like that is where it was a big thing. And then that the restaurant scene, Mm -hmm. I kind of really loved how this was just an, you know, a little kind of a small, not small, but like a small interpersonal story in this community. And it didn't involve like, you know, 
people getting oppressed. We touched on this. Mm -hmm. We didn't involve people getting depressed. We didn't have white people really in it much at all. And it was just people living their life. And you Mm -hmm. said this earlier, Curtis, it really does help humanize because when you read these books about how like, how, you know, black people back in the day, they suffered under slavery. They suffered under Jim Crow and they suffered all this, but like, it wasn't 24 seven. Well, yes, Mm -hmm. things were hard, but as a community, black people came together and, you know, they married, they had families, they celebrated things. And it was, it was nice to see that and be like, okay, yeah, things were hard, but people were still living their life. Mm-hmm. I feel like mm-hmm. we don't get to see that a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, we we always, and bringing it back, we always talk about that. We most often see that in uh, the street lit, in urban lit. I think in um, Addicted, we called it the Nellie Kelly neighborhood, <laughs> where it's just like everybody was black. Nobody was really questioning. Like yeah. There was oppression, but it wasn't like Danny said, always at the forefront of your mind, like you were living a life. And I think that's relatable because it's like how most of us live. Like, yes, there's oppression, Mm -hmm. but we're living our lives out here too. I think we talked about this in the last, or two of the last books that we read, um, Such a Fun Age and um, The Other Black Girl, where there's, there seems to be this, and it's not all, but it seems to be this, Uh, push in contemporary literary fiction where it is a black character surrounded by by white characters. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that's the story that's told over and over and over and over and over again. And it's like, yeah, that, that happens. That happens to most black people at some point or another, but it's not the only story that we have that's worth telling. Like we don't have to tell every black story in relation to uh, white oppression or white gaze or white uh, community. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it, and it makes it like these folks don't go home. They don't they they don't have Thanksgiving mm-hmm. dinner and sit around the table and everybody's family and mm-hmm. you know there it's like there's no peace mm-hmm. for people and you don't see that story where you just see a well no you do see stories where you see a lone white person. <laughs> But somehow or another, they become ruler of the world. So, okay, different, different thing. <sighs> yeah, okay. It's a matter of who. I wonder if the reason for the popularity is, you know, again, the folks who are selling books are trying to sell it to the widest audience possible. And maybe yeah. there's an audience of people who may not necessarily be black who are looking to buy books to, quote, understand, who want to know what it's like to be the lone black person in the white world. Whereas, you know, our lives are interesting alone. And mm-hmm. maybe the thought of telling a story of black people living amongst themselves and not engaging or not having to bump up against constantly racial prejudices is something people feel wouldn't be interesting or wouldn't sell. Mm. I think that's it. Yeah. I think it I think, is. Because I think oh, if you're yeah. outside, sorry, I was just going to think if you're outside it, you're like, well, then what's the, what's the catch, I guess? It's like, well, that's the catch. Just people living their lives. Yeah. But we're expected to read books like Laura Ingalls <laughs> Wilder <laughs> about mm-hmm. people living their lives. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you should read this. And don't you see, you know, and I've seen people, including some black conservatives I can think of, who are like, oh, no, you read these classics and you'll gain a lot from them. So War and Peace or this, and you'll gain a lot from it. And I'm like. Yeah, but that's a lot of energy, and I think I can actually <laughs> learn that same lesson from reading uh, Fawcett's books or Hughes or mm-hmm. Hurston or a bunch of other people who have some real good life lessons. Um, I don't think this person had the greatest. It's really about momentum and who decides something is what it is. It's kind of like, mm-hmm. well, it's like paintings and art and someone who decided that this scribble scribble mm-hmm. or this solid color mm-hmm. so a group of people it's like the emperor's new clothes a group of people with influence said nope this is worth something mm-hmm. and they have the money to make it worth something and mm-hmm. but in the reality if the if the apocalypse hit that art is worth nothing you know mm-hmm. <laughs> you know somebody a can opener might be worth a lot more. 
You have a can opener? Oh my gosh, that's the most right. valuable thing in the world right now. We can eat some beans. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that, and I and I think we have an opportunity, um, in this time with technology, um, to have these discussions, share like this, and kind of redefine for ourselves and not ask permission of other people mm-hmm. of what would be our classics. What are the mm-hmm. things we're going to put our momentum behind? And the fact that all three of us can get together and talk about a book that's 90 years old and um, how it makes us feel now and looking back at that time, it, it's great. And I think, you know, we, I think about when we came out of slavery, and I, granted, I was not around. I'm old, <laughs> but I'm not that old. <laughs> it came out of slavery. And, you know, you. You end up in you're in a culture, but you develop a culture that's like the culture that enslaved you, mm. as opposed to saying we're we're gonna make something different. So, what would have happened if collectively someone could be like Magneto and or something or Doctor X mm-hmm. and take control of all the black people's minds and say, well, we're gonna have a culture that's based on equality, and men and women are gonna share, and we're not gonna set up a patriarchy yeah. within this culture so like like you have chinese cultures within the u.s culture but it's very much a chinese culture you know they're not Mm -hmm. everyone's not trying to replicate u.s culture and um what if you what if that happened so we can't go back in time and make that happen be cool if i had dr x powers and could go back in time that'd be a good story Mm -hmm. but uh (laughs) but we can do that now in terms of our sharing this literature and um, talking about it. And hopefully other people will listen to it and kind of see, hey, you know, and hopefully some people who like street lit might say, you know what, maybe I'll go and listen to this. Because now mm-hmm. I have two authorities, Danny and Molly, who have <laughs> read and who can give some serious critique on it. And say, you know what, maybe this isn't so intimidating. Maybe, you know, mm-hmm. this story does kind of sound interesting. A uh, couple of quick questions. I, again, I want to be respectful of your time, you know, because I'm a big fan, but I'm not going to sit here and, well, four <laughs> hours later, I just want to ask one more question. <laughs> uh, two things, and you mentioned it. Um, the story is written 90 years ago, so the setting is different. Mm-hmm. Technology was just starting, you know, people were just starting to get cars. Uh, mm-hmm. People were, electricity was starting to get available to everyone Mm -hmm. a few people had radios telephones um what insights do you get into life at that time from reading this story um i think the transition um that they were in like i i'm i am getting more into history as i get out of school Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not as boring and stuffy and, um, you know, again, the way they teach it is like, if you're, if you're enjoying yourself, you're not have you're, you know, you're not learning anything, but history is so messy and Mm -hmm. it's, you know, filled with like imperfect people. So I've been learning more and more. And especially I think the 1900s were such a huge time of transition and cultural change and technology, technological change. Um, and, you know, ambition in this country across different racial level, um, racial levels across, like, there was obviously white people out here, or Disney that was being crazy, but black people too were, like you were saying, like, trying to figure out who we wanted to be and what we wanted our culture to look like. Um, so I, I loved that piece seeing, like, um, What's his name? Hackett pull up in that that sleigh to yeah. take her to the uh, <laughs> the ice dance, and it's got like the bells, and you know, in my mind, I was like, oh, oh, like I'm as impressed as she is because she's like, whoa, a sleigh, and then to see uh, the younger boys show up in cars, and they're trying to be yeah. all fancy. So I just love seeing like that and mirror how I feel about you know how rapidly things feel like they're changing now Uh with, you know, we say technology and we only mean like phones and uh, social media, but it's like, you know, throughout our history, 
there have been these periods of rapid change. There have been these periods where everything has changed and people adapt. And it was kind of cool to see that and have that connection. Like, oh, wow, even though this was 90 years ago, I feel like I can understand what they're feeling and I can understand what they're going through with all this excitement around quote unquote technology and quote unquote social changes. Um, even though it's things that seem very commonplace to me. Yeah. I'm going to start by saying I was impressed everyone had a phone in their house. Mm. So like you have Melissa being like this teenager waiting by the phone for Mallory to, or whichever bow she was waiting mm-hmm. on. She was always a different bow <laughs> waiting um, by the phone. Cause even that seemed like it was able to connect people better than had this been in, you know, maybe even 20 years ago where she would have mm-hmm. had to write letters to everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, I also kind of just going back, like how this is a time where there's just, and again, I'm not trying to paint things better than what they were, but it's just really refreshing to read this book and to read about all these black people who have options. So, you know, like mm-hmm. Mallory, he's like, oh, I'm going to become an engineer or a doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, granted, I'm thinking of a lot of men now that I say it. Um, Asher yeah. is like, he's going to go to college and, you know, have this opportunity to run this thing. Hackett, it's like, I want to be the first black person in the county or maybe the state. I can't remember what he said you know, to get into politics. And it was just really cool reading about these young black people who were like at this point of their lives where they could pick what they wanted to do because of the social change and things like that. Mm -hmm. And even the women, again, to a point, um, you know, Louise touched on how Laurentine, you know, she was, well, she had her own business. She was an entrepreneur. She would be a small business. She'd have, she might be part of LLC Twitter if she were around today. (laughs) You've got, you know, Melissa who, wants to um she does want to marry but she wants she doesn't want it again for the security she wants it for her own sort of selfish reasons and mm-hmm. she's even looking forward to you know the op- the choice that she can do that mm-hmm. so i just thought that was a really cool thing to read about and just how things had changed so much i think they say mr steed had mm-hmm. been a- alive so even within yeah. you know their their mm-hmm. immediate you know parents or grandparents lifetime that's so much that they would not have had open to them. Mm -hmm. So. Definitely. So looking at the lives of the women, then comparing it to the lives of women. Now, so you're both young women entering this world. Uh, Are you grateful you're alive now compared to then? (laughs) (laughs) How do you feel about that? Cause this, this is a story written by a woman. Mm-hmm. about the lives of women uh, how do you feel things have changed or how does it make you feel to hear about how, their choices they had to make it, it definitely doesn't seem like they were in as rough a position as say like uh janie from their eyes are watching god yeah mm-hmm. she had it rough like i would not want to be in janie's position <laughs> but like, you know i could i could stand and look out a window at a tree it'll be mm-hmm. fine <laughs> <laughs> or on my own, be a modiste, have rich, yeah. rich. Yeah. <laughs> I was jealous of Laurentine sewing skills. Yeah, that was she was accomplished. Um, I yeah, I I didn't get the sense, and maybe it's because again, this book seemed more modern, seemed more fresh. Um, like you're saying, female author, uh, we got a little bit more complexity um, to the women's lives. Um, but they didn't seem like Danielle said, like totally backed into corners or like they couldn't, they didn't have, um, they couldn't do what they wanted to do because they were women. Yes. I think that, you know, their society was shaping them and they ultimately what they were doing was tied to what kind of wife they could be, what kind of relationship they had could have to a man. But it didn't seem like they, or at least the book was trying to frame it that way. So I think that that makes it a little bit harder for me to say, like, you know, do I feel like it's better or worse now? Because I feel like it's it's kind of the same. Like, mm-hmm. you know, even today you can say, well, my my um, my choices aren't limited by my partner. But in a lot of the same ways they are, because in a lot of ways our society is set up that, you know, you need to have dual income. You need to have, you know, a partner who does this, this, and that mm-hmm. to either be respectable or to not be on like uh, 
um, Twitter or the read, what is it, with Wednesday Wisdom, acting a fool, <laughs> or to be able to like afford, you know, this or that, like, uh, yeah. just Markers. so exactly, and just so much of like women's earning power and so much of like what we're able to do, we're still facing a lot of the same issues, but it might not always be so blatant like you said at the beginning of the uh, episode about the you know there was no passive aggressive or microaggression racism there was just aggressive racism <laughs> yeah. so i feel like you know today we're less tolerant of um that aggressive sexism but you know it still shapes a lot of our lives i think in similar ways even though we're not always privy to how that's working or it's not always so transparent yeah. Yeah. I was going to chime in and say, like, Laurentine's angst felt really relatable because, like, I feel like that's how it is for maybe a lot of women today. Like, you don't have to get married for or find a relationship for physical, secure things. It's sort of to get those markers of adulthood or respectability or quote unquote making it mm. that society says, like, this is what you need. And so it's actually just really similar. The pressure is mostly, you know, society, not so much like, I don't know where I'm going with that one. So it's the same. It's it's society that sort of sets up these things. Mm -hmm. And I think it is slightly better. Well, actually, going back to what I said, I was impressed by some of the forward thinking quotes of a few of the characters in the book. There are a couple people who say, you know, like either whether they're talking about Laurentine's predicament or the predicament Sal was in with Colonel Holloway, where they said, like, you know, marriage is just an institution that, you know, man made up or um, <laughs> and that. And that, you know, marriage isn't the be all end all. And they would point out like Laurentine's business and her and her her beauty and her like her assets, the things she possessed within herself. Mm -hmm. So, again, this book was just it just really impressed me with how yeah, it wasn't perfect. Not everything was. But there mm -hmm. were like voices in the book that just felt like this could be from, you know, it's not that it's not that old. It's not that out of date. It's not that backwards. Yeah. Which makes it a classic, folks, because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you can gain something and you get some insight. Uh, as a guy, it makes me, I, I look at this and I, I think about my godchild and I'm like, oh, I'm glad she's not in this world because she mm -hmm. can make choices and she doesn't mm -hmm. have to, it's not a matter of, oh my goodness, how am I going to survive if some man doesn't pick me? But you still see sexism and Racial mm -hmm. bias and classism are kind of woven into things, and it's kind of hard to just make it go away. Mm -hmm. When it's, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> if it's part of the pipes under the concrete, it's mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, certain things. Well, no, that's how you get water from here to there. So, yeah, mm -hmm. got to deal with it, buddy. You know, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, but it it does make you have a great appreciation for the women who lived during that time and did what they were mm -hmm. doing. I think about Jessica mm -hmm. Redmond Fawcett and what she was doing and her brilliance. And even as I've learned a little bit about her story, she kind of got sidelined and, and a lot of it was just going up against some men, mm -hmm. including uh, I... maybe W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, <laughs> not mm -hmm. going along with that. And then, Unfortunately, we as black people took on the same attitudes that white male patriarchy had. So you had mm -hmm. men who wanted to be white men. And mm -hmm. maybe their frustration was, I can't be a white man, but I could act like one towards black women. Mm -hmm. And uh, sideline them when I want to, if I feel threatened, as opposed to, no, we can do something different. So yeah. I was just going to say, I really felt that with Denley's scene after the restaurant where he wanted to like fight the one restaurant owner mm -hmm. and he was like, why it's just so hard to be a man. But I, I like that it didn't go with him then taking it out on Laurentine. Like yeah. he mm -hmm. was aware of the problem. Mm -hmm. And I, I can see why maybe this isn't why Fawcett is it maybe more well known. It could be my own ignorance, but I could see, you know, the powers at the time saying, well, this doesn't, this is just a frivolous thing. Yeah. This is just a women's story. This doesn't uplift the black race. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's like, then the question is like, well, are our stories or like the way we were living, is that not worth preserving and learning about? Mm -hmm. 
Like, you know, do we always need to be striving? Can we just live? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But the thing is, I think at that time, because doesn't Booker Washington himself get a name drop? It feels like it seems like that wasn't the option. And I think that's what makes it really sad Mm -hmm. was that you always had to feel as if you were on display and had to. It was like respectability times 100, like when they had the fist fight at the carnival. And it wasn't the, you know, the older men telling the younger men not to fight because, you know, you shouldn't fight. It was the older men telling the younger men not to fight because there were too many white people around Around, watching. But I, I, it, it brings me back to something you said, Curtis, earlier, that I'm going to steal, and I will promise to quote you it's when okay. you say it, but you will <laughs> definitely hear us saying it, but that we can reclaim and say what our classics are, yeah, and we can rebuild, because I'm very much on the Magneto Professor X side, I'm very much a Magneto, tear it down, start over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> you know, if we have the opportunity here today um, to say like, well, okay, this is what I think is worth keeping then moving forward. Like this could be a classic. These stories could be worthy. And it doesn't just have to be the same old, same old over and over again, because as I said, books persevere. We have mm-hmm. access to them in ways that we don't other media. So mm-hmm. it's just such a wonderful opportunity that, you know, I'm going to take forward. And like I said, I'll quote you. It's okay. No, I this that. might be a recurring thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say yes. This was a great opportunity, and it exposed me to a title that I don't know if I would have found on my own, mm-hmm. just because of the type of reading I do. Like I, I realize I don't read a lot of classics or older books very often. I read a lot of. I'm very much a new release person, mm-hmm. and that's something I think about myself, about how I want to improve my reading. But mm-hmm. I really do appreciate this opportunity to, you know, learn about who. Jesse Redmond Faust was and listen to a previous few of the previous episodes and hear more about her previous work. So yeah, this was a great opportunity. Yeah. And I, and I, I really, really appreciate you sharing and, and bringing your insights into this. Uh, I'm loving uh, reading her books and uh, you know, again, I stumbled upon it and um, like you said, we can define our own and we don't mm-hmm. have to ask, but what's great is we don't have to ask permission. Mm-hmm. And we can put it out there. And um, I, I was thinking recently that now technology allows a lot of things for black uh, people. We weren't able when I was growing up. And so when I was in college in the uh, 80s, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of cool things that were going on. that ended up having to get canceled because you just couldn't fiscally do it. And so it's mm-hmm. kind of like. The analogy I would give is you have a plane that's going to take two miles to take off, but you're only given 100 feet of runway. Mm-hmm. And now we have infinite runways. You know, you can put a podcast up and it can one person could listen to it or a million people could listen to it. But the point mm-hmm. is, you can put it up and it's out there so that two years from now, someone discovers it and it's there. So we have the opportunity to define our own ideas of what the classics are or help people discover books and great stories to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think your podcast, Black Chick Lit, is a great place for people to start and they can have fun. You you have a lot of fun. And, (laughs) And I mean, especially when it's a story, a book that you didn't really you had problems <laughs> with, yeah. Those are the best ones. Yeah, those are the ones you're like, oh man, I think, I don't, I'm going to just read that just to see how bad if it was really that bad. As Danny Molly said, <laughs> not that you're tearing up an author just to tear him up, but some people. I mean, it's 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 the story it was, uh, <laughs> but you also help people discover books, and you had some great collabs with people. I know you had a collab with uh, uh, Aku and Marcy. Uh, mm-hmm. recently and they're, they're they're two great folks two fun yeah. people and uh what other things are going on at black chick lit that is a good question <laughs> <laughs> we so we we do chats on and off so our next episode will be us kind of being you know i said in the episode old men yelling at the clouds because mm-hmm. we sort of talk about like twitter and social media and its impact in the book world we mm-hmm. haven't done a chat in a while we like to do those where it's not us talking about a title but it's us mm-hmm. talking about like our perspectives of black readers of what's going on. 
Mm-hmm. We are scheduled to do another collaboration. It won't be on our podcast. Like, um, this word is loaded. It's a smut. So they read, you know, books that are sexy and then they talk about, you know, how, how that goes. And so mm-hmm. we're mm-hmm. going to go on one of those next. We have not yet picked our title. We have, we have thrown out options. We're, we're kind of, we kind of go where the wind takes us That's yeah. okay. when it comes to picking books. So, I was going to say we had options, including um like uh the sequel to the marriage pass. And then there was one that was, um, it was a spooky book that sort of looks at the topic of, you know, plantations now becoming like wedding venues. And mm. I cannot remember the name of it, but I'm sure, I'm sure we'll, you'll hear it talked about because I was really excited when I heard about it. I do not have a lot of specifics. I'm so Okay. Sorry. No, but also, you know, big folks, Danny and Molly have a great catalog. So you go there. Just start browsing through. Just go to Black Chick Lit, B L A C K C H I C K L I T dot com. Mm-hmm. Go to their website and just browse through the catalog. You're going to find some interesting things. And then subscribe, listen to the podcast. You're going to have fun. So if you're yeah. someone who's like, I don't know, you know, I want to <laughs> get into reading, but I don't know what. You're gonna be like, ooh, that sounded fun. I'm gonna read that one, you know. <laughs> I I did want to say we are gonna be moderators. Um yes. I don't know if you're familiar with Mocha Girl Reads. Yeah. And Black Man Reads. They're doing a uh readers conference. Oh, okay. At mm-hmm. the end of October, the okay. 30th and 31st. And we're gonna ma- moderate a panel, I believe, with um Fair Roshan. Who are the other two, Danny? Um Is it's Vanessa some- Vanessa Riley, Tasha mm-hmm. Harrison. Katrina Jackson and DL White. Ah, okay. that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It's so exciting. I'm there. really excited. Yeah, that'll be our our you know, kind of big stepping out moment. <laughs> yeah. I think you're going to do fantastic. Well, Thank if you, you. were to recommend an episode, which one do you think is like a good oh, first? Oh, that is a good question. I did listen to several of your episodes, Curtis, and you're very chill. Like you're very intellectual, super thoughtful. I got you fooled. <laughs> <laughs> so Our energy is a bit more manic than that. <laughs> right. But I'm trying to think of something. Let me pull it up because... Like I am tempted to go with addicted, which is my personal yeah, favorite. That one, you. <laughs> I don't know if we can just dump people in that. One. <laughs> that one is. It was a lot. Like when that you whole said, conversation oh, I... about the nacho sauce. <laughs> yeah, nacho <laughs> cheese. That's be like ready. at the Tyler Perry movie. Mm, I hate it. I hate it. I need to redo our website so that the episodes are easier to see. That's the thing I'm going to work on. <laughs> oh. I might say their eyes are watching God. Just that because is, that's a good one. That was yeah. a good one. One of my favorite books. And it's just like if you you know, we're we're we talked a lot about Street Lit in this one, and that one is even more so like a grandmother mm-hmm. of these tropes. And it's just mm-hmm. it's fun and it's messy, but Zora Neale Hurston is like a hero of mine and it just mm-hmm. really but I'm gonna have to read more. Of um Jesse too because I I thoroughly enjoy this book and I want to I I think I'm hungry for this type of representation across you know different time periods and across different settings um, that I just didn't know existed before we started this project. Yeah, so we're all we're all growing and learning and and sharing and uh, hopefully folks will come across. And hey, if you've ever heard like everybody keeps talking about their eyes are watching God. But I don't know. Okay, listen to Danny and Molly. They'll make you. Oh, okay, I can read this book. Yes, <laughs> I yeah, can yes. Read, it's going to be fun. I can read this book. Yes, yeah. if you've never read it, just don't. You don't even have to listen. Just go read it. That's such a great book. Like, and mm-hmm. if you like this book, if you paused, you know, the episode to read the China Berry Tree, and then came back, and now you're like, where do I go next? I, I think that would be a good next step. Yeah, yeah. And Ruby D narrates the audiobook so if you're more of an audiobook reader that is like she does a great performance mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. oh yeah there are the ones yeah definitely well danny molly thank you i really 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 do appreciate your time your wisdom uh this has been a treat for me and uh i hope in the future well once we get off the air i'm gonna 
pitch another idea for you. It's, it's some okay. ratchet. It, it's, it. it's not ratchet, okay. but it's some shenanigans. So I want to. We love yeah. shenanigans. Yeah, some <laughs> shenanigans. So, but everyone, check out Black Chick Lit, and you will not be disappointed. <laughs> and if you want to see all of Jesse Redmond's Fawcett's books, go to IFoundThisGreatBook.com slash Jesse. J-E-S-S-E. All of her books are there. All of the discussions, including this one, are there. And later on this year, we'll be talking about the last book in her series of four books that she wrote that Jesse Redmond Fawcett wrote. Danny, Molly, thank you. And everyone listening, stay safe and have a great reading day.